tonight on All In. He's used $50 million of his campaign funds on legal fees. Donald Trump takes the money and runs. Trump was pushing them to do that. He wanted to be named the presumptive nominee. Tonight, how Trump has effectively destroyed his own political party, up and down the ticket. Then... This is a dangerous moment in the Middle East. The latest on a possible U.S. military response as the Republican frontrunner avoids the issue. If you were in the White House today, would you strike Iran directly? It wouldn't have happened if I were in the White House. Plus, Republican infighting over border security and tax cuts. Which one will win out? Get your taxes down. Thank you. Thank you. And the podcaster from Texas under pressure. I'm right now, as you know, in a very tough re-election race in Texas. One of the Democrats seeking to topple Ted Cruz joins me when All In starts right now. Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. Well, we got some news today that confirms something that we kind of knew already, which is the Republican Party doesn't really exist anymore as an institution. It has essentially been cannibalized by Donald Trump, subsumed into MAGA, with profound implications both for Republicans and for the American democratic system as a whole. You can see the evidence of this everywhere you look, like a new revelation that the Republican National Committee's anemic fundraising has left it with a paltry $8 million on hand. Not exactly the war chest a major political party needs in an election year, especially considering Democrats have nearly three times as much in their coffers. Speaking to Puck, one RNC member offered this blunt assessment, quote, we're not in as strong of position as we'd like to be. Certainly, fundraising is way below what we've hoped. Puck also reports Trump world is rather unhappy with the state of affairs at the RNC, and they are looking to install a MAGA loyalist at the top something Steve Bannon openly advocated for earlier this week when he called for the ouster of party chair Ronna Romney McDaniel. Why is Ronna McDaniel and that team over there, they don't want to do it because they understand they're culpable. What in the hell was the RNC doing? They're guilty of a mortal sin against this republic, and that sin is not going to go away until she is removed as the chairman of the RNC. I'm tired of the happy talk, and we're going to—you know why she's got to take out a line of credit? Because you cut her off, right? The war room, I said not another penny, not another 25 bucks or 50 bucks a month, not one cent until they're gone. Okay, now let's just be clear here. The idea that Steve Bannon, too shirt is strategic genius, is solely responsible for the pitiful fundraising of the committee is laughable. That's not it. But it does remain true the MAGA movement has had it with the RNC, which is ironic for a number of reasons. First of all, because RNC chair Ronna Romney McDaniel is so unabashedly pro-MAGA, she tried to pressure Nikki Haley, Trump's only credible remaining opponent in the Republican primary, to drop out, only for Trump to then stab McDaniel in the back so he could play benevolent dictator and say that Haley should stay in the race. It's also ironic because Trump, of all people, is partially responsible for the RNC's financial rows. Because his super PACs are hoovering up all of the small dollar donations so he can use them to pay his tens of millions of dollars in legal bills. And to be clear, it is always the case to some extent the presidential candidate and their movement controls the purse strings of their respective parties during election year. But Trump is just on another level as he subsumes the Republican Party into his own party of one. And you can see the trickle down effects of this all over the country as the Republican Party, as a party, destroys itself like a snake eating its own tail. A lot of the problems are because Trump himself is a conspiracy-obsessed maniac who cultivates the most deranged characteristics in his diehard policies. In Michigan, the state Republican Party voted to fire its head, Christina Caramo, earlier this month and replace her with Pete Hoekstra, a former Republican congressman and Trump ambassador to the Netherlands. If you're a regular watcher of this program, you might remember Caramo. She's the election-denying conspiracy theorist who ran to be Michigan's Secretary of State in 2022. Having intimate relationships with people who are demonically possessed or oppressed, I strongly believe that a person opens themselves up to possession. Demonic possession is real. How people become possessed, I don't know all the details of it, but I would surmise 
that the sexual licentiousness in our culture is a lot of spiritual things that are going wrong. So she didn't win that race in 2022, thankfully. And you can see why Michigan Republicans have decided they don't want Caramel running the show anymore. Here's the thing. She's refusing to step down. And it's now splitting its party in half. In fact, the RNC held a big meeting today with representatives from across the nation. And Michigan Republicans did not have a seat at the table because Caramel refuses to step down and hand the reins to Hoekstra. In fact, both of them showed up today, each claiming they are in charge of the Michigan Republican Party and neither one was officially recognized by the RNC. Now, factional weirdness happens in politics all the time, these kind of party fights. So if this was a one-off, you could say, uh, yeah. But it's not just Michigan. This is like, a, this is a trend, okay? In Arizona, you've got the failed MAGA gubernatorial candidate, Carrie Lake, who is now involved in a convoluted feud that has pushed out that state's Republican chairman, Jeff DeWitt. Now, depending on who you ask, DeWitt either tried to bribe Lake to stay out of the upcoming Senate race, or he was the victim of an elaborate scheme from Lake to oust him from his position so that she can claim total control of the state party. Now, there's a new head of the Arizona Republican Party, a so-called election integrity activist who worked on Trump's 2020 campaign. Although her election to party chair wasn't all smooth sailing, as the New York Times reports, get this, quote, the vote was delayed by a lengthy debate over a motion to ban the use of electronic tabulators mistrusted by many election deniers in the party to count the ballots. But we're not done. Meanwhile, in Nevada, where the Republican Party is run by a guy who was literally criminally indicted for his role in Trump's fake elector scheme, the state is holding both the Republican primary and a caucus next week. Because of, again, some complicated infighting, uh, Nikki Haley would be on the primary ballot while Donald Trump will be competing in the caucus. Now, the caucus is the one actually awarding delegates which means the whole contest is basically rigged in his favor, which is the whole point of them concocting this entire enterprise. Also, another irony, of course, because if the situation was reversed, Trump would be railing to anyone and everyone about how the contest is being stolen from him. And this is what you got to understand. When he calls things rigged, that is an aspiration. It's not moral condemnation. He wants things to be rigged in his favor. That is his model. He thinks everything is rigged and should be rigged in his favor. And I'm pretty sure, to be fair, he would win a fully fair, unrigged Republican primary. That said, it's hard to disentangle the current mess the party finds itself in from Trump and his movement's obvious power grab, the complete control the MAGA movement has over the entirety of the party apparatus. And again, this isn't just some, like, backroom politics of the RNC and the Republican Party. This is Donald Trump's vision for the entire country. To bend the fabric of reality and the American experiment and its political system to his whims. The current broken state of the Republican Party you see, which is now run by cranks, whose only qualification is their fealty to him, is his vision for the whole U.S. government. Jess McIntosh is a Democratic strategist who served as a senior advisor to the 2016 Hillary campaign. Sarah Longwell is the publisher for The Bulwark, host of the Focus Group podcast, and they join me now. Sarah, let me start with you as someone who's been in and around Republican politics for a long time. I mean, from time to time, you'll see, like, weird party fights crop up. It's not, you know, and those happen in Democratic parties sometimes. But, like, the sort of full-spectrum nuttiness and fighting from state to state, again, in states that are going to be really crucial for the election. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. Yeah, I mean, here's what's crazy. Back before Donald Trump took everything over, he was the crank. He was like the head crank in charge, and he was surrounded by lots of other cranks. But the voters wanted him, and normal Republicans sort of eschewed him and wanted to walk away from him. But what has happened over the last seven years is the total inverse of that, the reverse of it. So right now, Donald Trump now is surrounded by people like Susie Wiles and Chris Lasavita and has real people around him, but he has stacked the rest of the party right. with lunatics and cranks whose only qualification, you just said this, but this was this was sort of my point too, is the, the reason that there's been this brain drain is because the litmus test or the qualifications necessary now to be in the party apparatus is only, are you the most MAGA? Are you the most loyal to Trump? And people who are willing to be like in the Kerry Lake sort of vein of 
total sycophant to Trump, those are the people who are rising to the top. But they never they don't have any real skills. You know, they're not capable of running state parties. They're not capable of making things happen. And so weirdly now, Trump controls the money, he controls the center of gravity, and he's populated by sort of this pygmy colony of weirdos uh, who do nothing but support him. There's also this rigged charge. I mean, you know, you're a veteran of that 2016 contested primary yes. in the Democratic Party, which which was which was very bitterly contested in many mm -hmm. ways, and lots of sort of frustration about like was the DNC being a neutral arbiter? There's not nothing like they have had two contests, mm -hmm. and there was a move of Ronald McDaniel getting on air to be like, you need to drop out. There was a move for a resolution, like not even pretending any neutrality. And of course, again, this is the vision that he has for all politics. Like that yes. I win, heads I win, tails you lose. Absolutely. You can see how he has reshaped just about every aspect of the electoral system. The voters are different now. Yep. Uh, the, the local officials are different now. The candidates are different now. But almost nowhere is it more stark than in the party apparatus itself. And it's for the exact point that you and Sarah have both made. If you make your litmus test, absolute fealty to an unhinged racist weirdo, guess what kind of people you get? That's what's stacked top to bottom now. And at some point, like, I usually chafe when we're like, Donald Trump is so new and different and he's totally remade the Republican Party. And it's like, nah, you can trace this back to Newt Gingrich and Lee Atwater right, and yeah. sowing the seeds that would eventually get you the kind of racist, unhinged autocrat that Donald Trump is. I think where the Republicans didn't necessarily lay the groundwork for it is in such a grifter. I don't think they ever well, expected that. that somebody like that was going to come in and then scoop up all of their small dollars for his own legal fee to pay his own I criminal... Mean, I mean... Well, that's the thing about the, the money, right? right? So, I mean, one of the things, Sarah Long, Sarah, is that, the you know, parties have gotten weaker um, over time. Partly that's because they can only raise as hard as money, and so the combination of, you know, McCain-Feingold plus Citizens United means the super PACs can raise unlimited amounts of money. You've got this whole different structure. The parties... Both parties have less financial relevance. But it's also like there is one-to-one -one displacement happening here. I think the RNC raised, if I'm not mistaken, like $80 million last year, and Trump had 50 in legal fees. That's like, I mean, those dollars, it's, it is a fixed pie. Like there's a certain amount of small dollar Republican conservative donors. There's a certain amount of money that's going to come flowing in. And right now, 50 mil yoink into the legal fees. And I've got bad news for them. It's about to get worse. I mean, yes. the guy is going to be in court the entire time that they are trying to raise money to run races with. And, and it's not Donald Trump's not the only person in the Republican Party, right? They have Senate races. They have down ballot races. There's a lot of other people who are hoping to have money. And that's what has always been so crazy to me about the Republican Party in a normal world and in a healthy political environment they would be upset with him about this, about draining resources for the betterment of the party. But that's always been the thing about Donald Trump. He doesn't care about the Republican Party. And the less he cares about the Republican Party, the more desperately they are trying to right. you know, help him and do whatever they can for him, always to the detriment of the party, certainly to the detriment of any kind of principle or you know, meaningful um, ideological, you know, <laughs> place a, like thing that they want to do. It's just all about Trump. They're not going to have a platform. Uh, they're not going to be able to raise money for their Senate candidates. They're just going to go all in on Trump. That's the only game in town anymore. It is the whole Republican Party. And Republicans have nobody to put to blame but themselves because they let this happen. They could have stood up a million different times in a yep. million different ways. They chose not to. And that's why we're here. Well, and to Sarah's point, Jess, I mean, you know, as a veteran of, of campaigns and politics, like resources really do matter and they matter the more the lower down you get. Yes. Right. So like when you're talking about, you know, presidential campaigns, it's like these are people with very high name recognition. Mm -hmm. The marginal dollar matters less. When you're talking about a contested house race, like right. it matters a lot. And again, He's going to face more legal troubles this year. He's already got $83 million he's got to pay E. Jean Carroll. Could be $200 million plus from New York. We'll see. And then actually paying his lawyers. And he, the one thing he's gotten great at is small dollar donors off his legal fees. That is going to suck up even more of that money. Well, that's his strategy. His strategy is to use every bit of legal liability that he has to raise small dollar donations. And you're absolutely right about how important that is lower down the ballot. If you have $10 to send to a, a, a political candidate, send it to a state legislative race. Right. It will matter. It's yeah. a drop in the bucket for a presidential. Yeah. So he is 
he's just siphoning off everything that would possibly be able to help rebuild the Republican Party right. if and when he steps off of the stage. Um, he's going to make sure that he leaves it just an absolute abject wasteland. Yeah, um, and one of the arguments Nikki Haley make, is making right now is that she's polling better than him and also those will have implications for down ballot. Mm -hmm. I think it's a totally legit argument based in data and a rational one. I don't think anyone's listening or the people she needs to persuade are listening. But, you know, what can I do? Jess McIntosh and Sarah Longwell. Thank you both. Thank you. Coming up, podcaster and part-time Senator Ted Cruz complains he's been forsaken by his party. But first, as they try to take back the White House, Republicans once again reveal the only policy, the only one that truly matters to them. That's next. <laughs> Something pretty amazing happened on Capitol Hill yesterday. In the midst of an election year and deep political divisions, a big bipartisan majority in the House passed a major piece of legislation. The $78 billion tax bill that passed yesterday is a compromise that gives each party something it wants. Democrats get an expansion of the child tax credit, albeit scaled back from the version that passed in 2021 and lapsed after a year. The legislation would get eligible families an average tax cut of $680, and lift as many as 400,000 children above the poverty line in one year, according to estimates. So that was a big priority for Democrats. Now, you will never guess what Republicans wanted in exchange. A bunch of tax breaks for businesses and corporations. And they got it. As Bloomberg explains, the bill would restore expired tax breaks, allowing businesses to more quickly recoup the cost of domestic research and development, interest on business loans, and investment in equipment. Boeing, General Motors, Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple are among the companies that stand to benefit. Now, this is sort of a perfect illustration of the priorities of the two parties and whose material interests they pursue. Democrats were like, please, just a few hundred dollars a month for families with kids. And Republicans responded, OK, if you give us tax breaks for some of the wealthiest companies in the world, we can get to a deal. But the compromise worked, at least in the House, and may not hold in the Senate. Uh, the president look good mailing out checks before the election means that he could be reelected and then we won't extend the 2017. Oh, well, he's being honest about it. We don't want to do any good because it might help Biden. For Grassley and some of his colleagues, it is more important to reelect Donald Trump than literally to put more money in working families' pockets or even in the coffers of big businesses. So this will be a test for Trump's Republican Party? Will they destroy a deal for political purposes or seize the opportunity to actually get something done? Right now, that very same question is hanging over another bipartisan deal that has been teetering on the edge of collapse. You've probably heard about this one because after months of intense negotiations, a bipartisan group of senators hammered out an agreement on the border. And it is pretty much a clear win for Republican policy priorities there. The deal would, as far as we know, again, they haven't released a text, impose new limits and standards for people seeking asylum in the United States. It would speed up the processing of those asylum claims and make it harder for migrants to appeal if they are rejected. The Department of Homeland Security will also gain new authority to basically close the border if the number of crossings passes a certain threshold, though it's a little unclear how you implement that. You got Republican senators, including key negotiator James Langford of Oklahoma, who are desperately begging in every venue they can for their colleagues to support what they say is like an enormous win, the best deal they're going to get. This is a historic moment to reform the border in a way that would give tools to the next president they don't have today and lessen the flow to take pressure off people in Texas and Arizona and all throughout the border. Well, the Democrats will not give us, will not give us anything close to this uh, if we have to get 60 votes in the United States Senate in a Republican majority. We have a unique opportunity here, and um, the, the timing is right to, to do this. This is our moment to actually say, let's do as much as we can possibly get done. But this has a very significant change in our border security, and that's what Americans are crying for. By the way, everyone basically agrees on that. I mean, immigration advocates uh, who don't like the bill at all are, are very worried about it. Uh, it. Again, we don't have bill tech yet, so, like, they're not just, like, Trumping this up. This is true. OK, so here they got to win. But once again, what's going to happen? Well, the problem is Donald Trump and his insatiable thirst for another term in the White House. You see, Trump and his allies desperately want to use the crisis of the border and the real human lives on each side of it as a political tool. So what they're going to try to do is just kill the deal 
So the border remains in, as they say, crisis, and they can attack President Joe Biden on the campaign trail. There is zero chance I will support this horrible open borders betrayal of America. It's not going to happen. I'd rather have no bill than a bad bill, a bad bill you can't have. And that's what was happening in the House. Donald Trump, name three things in the bill. Just give me three. <laughs> it's funny to even think about. It. So as usual, Trump's lackeys in Congress are lining up to do his bidding. Speaker Mike Johnson already called the deal dead on arrival in the House. So now you've got on both these issues, right, two bipartisan compromises in each house, the border and taxes, and Republicans face this really interesting test. What do they actually care about and what do they just like to talk about? And I'm going to make a prediction. I think they're going to kill the border deal because they like to talk about immigration, the politics of the border, and they love beating up on Democrats and love beating up on immigrants. But they don't actually care about the substance of it. They don't care about the policy, about improving it. Just look at what happened the last time they had unified government. Remember this happened? The first half of Donald Trump's term. What, what did they do? Oh, right. Yeah, nothing. They didn't build the wall. They didn't stem the flow of migrants seeking asylum. They did absolutely nothing to solve the problem when they had unified control. But you know what they did do? You know what they got done? They enacted, again, massive tax cuts for corporations and wealthy individuals. Because at its core, underneath all the rhetoric, cutting taxes for businesses, corporations and rich people is it. It's the single policy focus, the modern Republican Party. It is the only thing, the only thing they are actually invested in getting done. And so my prediction is that they find a way to tax, to pass the tax bill, that it will pass and the border bill will hit the cutting room floor. We'll see if I'm right. I'm right now, as you know, in a very tough re-election race in Texas. The Democrats, Chuck Schumer has made clear I'm his number one target. The Democrats intend to spend over $100 million to defeat me in Texas. We just had a poll last week that showed it as a one-point race. And yet, we can expect Mitch again not to spend any money to defend me. I, I'm sitting in a glass house throwing stones. Take it from someone who knows that guy really likes the sound of his own voice. <laughs> The last time that Ted Cruz ran for re-election, he sweated out a narrow victory over Beto O'Rourke of less than three points. You would think that would be a wake-up call for the Texas senator to start laser-focusing on the needs of his constituents. But instead, just over two years after his narrow victory, he tried to secretly jet off to Cancun during the worst weather disaster his state had seen in a long time, one that killed nearly 250 people. Recently, it seems like he's basically reduced himself to being a part-time senator and nearly full-time podcaster. Get this. Last week, he posted five different episodes. Five different podcast episodes. He's a senator. He is now facing another real re-election challenge. As you heard, he's a little worried. He's not getting the support he needs from fellow Republicans. Congressman Colin Allred of Texas is running in the Democratic race against Texas State Senator Roland Gutierrez and others to challenge Cruz. He previously served in the Department of Housing and Urban Development under President Obama. For that, he was an NFL linebacker, and I just learned he's a fourth-generation tax <laughs> right. joins me now. Good to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, this is, people might think this is weird or petty, but I, I'm going to talk. I think it's weird for a U.S. senator to do five podcast yeah, episodes yeah, a week. Yeah. I'm not wrong, that's right? right? No, that's right. I mean, it's very time-consuming. Like, when I appear on a podcast, it takes time. But being the host, and he normally does three a week, so I, that was actually news for me that he was up to five. <laughs> Uh, he, he's a media personality. He's not serious about being a senator. I feel like there's some level at which maybe you're help, if you beat him, you help him. Because <laughs> he really just wants to do that full time, which, again, no shade. Hey, you know what I mean? Right, but, right. but, I mean, you might be giving him a hand. Yeah, that's what he wants to do. He's not a serious legislator. I mean, we're talking about these negotiations in the Senate right now. You'll never see him a part of those negotiations. He won't be rolling up his sleeves and trying to figure out a compromise on how we can you know, legislate to move forward. This is what he does. He goes on podcasts. He goes on you know, cable news. And that's what he does. And, and in fact, I mean, this I, I thought this border story that we just talked about, you would have a lot to say about. You have been critical of the handling by this president, Joe Biden, of the border. You were among three Texas Democrats who voted to condemn the president's handling southern border. Um, you touted your own bipartisan legislation would help secure the border, provide a pathway to citizenship for dreamers and others who are living here, follow laws, surge resources to border patrol and border community. So you've been sort of trying to work on something like this. Yeah. The Senate compromise doesn't even have some of the stuff in here. Yeah. Like there's not, no path to citizenship for the dreamers, all this. Right. That's right. You 
I know we don't have paper on it yet, but would yeah. you support that legislation? I mean, I think so. Uh, we haven't gotten all the details, but from what we are seeing, it looks like uh, it's an attempt to deal with an asylum system that's broken, uh, to you know, faster process and to set some standards that uh, I think probably have to be set in terms of what's the threshold to have your asylum claim heard. Uh, but listen, you know, Ted Cruz is not going to be a part of any of this. And he said uh, in a Senate meeting, it kind of leaked out, I guess, a, a lunch meeting of theirs, that he's worried about the politics of it, not the policy, the politics of it. And that's where the cynicism comes in. That's what I think Texans are so sick of. I, I mean, I think he said both privately and publicly. So I think what happened was that there was that caucus lunch they all had after the deal was struck. And it was after Trump won New Hampshire. McConnell's like, the politics of this have changed. We need the crisis. Basically, he didn't say yeah, this, but basically. we want the crisis to keep going. Mm -hmm. I guess it makes me wonder, like, maybe they don't think it's correct. I mean, like, I just find it pretty wild. Like, you've, it, to me, it's a really defining issue about the nature of these different senators. Like, Langford is a conservative dude. Yeah. In your neighboring state of Oklahoma. That's right. He's not like a squish. That's right. And he's running around being like, guys, we got it. Let's do it. That's right. Also, for Texas, you know, we're a border state. And so there's probably no state that would that needs this to be addressed more. The right? vast majority of the crossings are happening in, in Texas. State, that's right. You know, and we have a record number in December of over 300,000. Texas feels that. So you would think that a Texas senator would then say, I want to respond to this and find a way legislatively. But of course, as we saw in the clip there, and as we know from his character, he's just looking for the next election uh, so he can keep podcasting. One of the uh, one of the issues that I think there will be a very clear difference between uh, if you were to win the nomination, I think any Democrat, frankly, against Ted Cruz will be on the issue of abortion. Yeah. He is strongly uh, in, in favor of the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision, strongly opposed to abortion rights. I want to just play um, a little bit of your campaign ad because I think it highlights the message that you or other Democrats, not just in Texas, are going to be running on in this year. Take a listen. Right. For women in this state, the fear is real. Texas's abortion ban is a threat to their lives, to all of our freedom. That's why I'm running for Senate, to end this abortion ban. Because in Texas, we stand up for freedom. Your state has a very restrictive ban. It was at the front edge of this, obviously, with the SB8 yeah. law. Um, do you think a, a abortion rights referendum statewide would win in Texas? I think it would. Uh, I don't think the legislature will let us do that. They never will. No. <laughs> um, but, you know, what's happening in Texas is a, is a tragedy. It really is. Um, what we are seeing is what a total ban on abortion looks like, which is, you know, uh, a mother of two who has a much wanted third pregnancy, who has to go to the emergency room four times. Her doctor tells her she needs a medically necessary abortion. She asks her state to get that care close to home. And they say no. And they don't just say no. They say, we're going to prosecute your doctor your hospital, you're going to be subject to this ridiculous bounty law that we have in the state. We have counties saying you can't drive through our county if you're going to use those roads to access an abortion. There's one thing I know about Texans, and as you said, I'm a fourth-generation Texan. I went to Baylor. My family's from Brownsville. Grew up in Dallas. I know who we are. We believe in freedom, and this is not freedom. This is not who we are, and that's why we have to make sure that folks know the only way we can fix this is by beating Ted Cruz and codifying at the federal level Roe v. Wade. Our state's not going to do it. But we can do it at the federal level. We can restore this right. Do you that the, the president had a rally where he said he, he pledged to do that? There have been there have been this sort of push and pull about a clarity on the message from Democrats. Yeah. Right. Which is like you can't unring the bell of Roe. Right. <laughs> the court is what it is. But you think do you think there's unanimity across all aspects of the Democratic Party that this is a singular focus for all of you running in contested swing races in the House, in Senate races and, and yeah. at the top of the ticket? Well, it should be uh, because we have to. Uh, you know, we passed in the last Congress a couple of times when. Women's Health Protection Act, which would codify Roe. We couldn't get it to the Senate, even though we had 50 votes. When I'm in the Senate, we will have to get that done uh, because we have to restore these rights. And you know, I'm a voting rights lawyer as well before I came to Congress. We have to restore that right as well. We have to you know, go back and I think uh, you know, solidify some of these foundational rights that have been eroded by what I think is a rogue Supreme Court uh, and also, of course, years of inaction and unable to get things through the Senate. Um, final question for you. Do you think you can go talk to the folks of Texas about this Biden economy or this economy? Well, listen, with, the, economy, with a story yeah, to tell. Yeah. Well, you know, I come from a family where my, I was raised by a single mom, was a public school teacher. We we were kind of one of those families where you swipe your debit, debit card and you pray uh, when you go to the store. So I, I know, you know, what families have been facing, but I also know who's fighting to lower your costs. Who wants to expand the child tax credit so 16 million kids will benefit from it? Who wants to lower your health care costs and cap the cost of insulin at 35 bucks a month? Ted Cruz voted against that. 
who are they looking out for, as I think you talked about in the previous segment, and who are we looking out for? We want to lower your costs. We want to make life more affordable for you. We want to give you a chance to chase your version of the American dream. We're on, and I'm on, your side. That's my message it's going to be. All right, Congressman Cullen, I'll read that primary will be in March, if I'm not mistaken, right. right? Super Tuesday. Uh, we will be watching it closely. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming by. Thank Come you. by anytime you're in New York. Thanks a lot. Coming up, Donald Trump tries to punt on one of the biggest problems a president has to address, hoping everyone forgets he was already president once. I was there. I remember. Well, this is a dangerous moment in the Middle East. We will continue to work to avoid a wider conflict in the region. But we will take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our interests, and our people. And we will respond when we choose where we choose, and how we choose. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin held his first press conference today on the situation in the Middle East, echoing the White House, promising response to the attack that killed three American soldiers in Jordan this past weekend. Today was Austin's first time at a podium since revealing his prostate cancer diagnosis. And he apologized for concealing his condition, even from the White House, until he had to be hospitalized over the new year. I want to be crystal clear. We did not handle this right, and I did not handle this right. I should have told the president about my cancer diagnosis. I should have also told my team and the American public. And I take full responsibility. I apologize to my teammates and to the American people. Austin took some tough questions about his decision to keep his diagnosis and hospitalization secret, and also about U.S. support for Israel's continued offensive in Gaza. You told Israeli leaders they have to protect civilian lives in Gaza. Since that speech, 12,000 more Palestinians have been killed. <coughs> We're now at 27,000 killed. Why are you still supporting this war? We are starting to see uh, the Israelis kind of shift their stance and, and change their approach to a more uh, focused uh, and uh, um, uh, a controlled, well, not, control is probably not the right word, but a more focused effort, uh, focused on a discrete set of objectives. President Biden today was focused on violence in another Palestinian territory, the West Bank. The administration rolled out an executive order to freeze any U.S. assets of violent Israeli settlers. The West Bank hasn't gotten the same attention as the war in Gaza in the aftermath of October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. But 300 Palestinians have been killed by Israelis there just since the war started with much of the violence coming from settlers who have seized Palestinian properties, burned homes and businesses, intimidated residents into leaving and evacuating their villages outright. Netanyahu government, which is politically aligned with the settler movement, has downplayed that violence. But Biden took action after the shooting death of an American teen who was visiting the West Bank last month. Witnesses say he was shot by a settler. This is, of course, also a domestic political challenge for Biden. His support for Israel's war appears to be hurting him significantly with young voters. It shows up in polling and po after polling, and it is definitely hurting him with Muslim and Arab American voters, as evidenced by the protests that met him when he made a campaign stop today in Michigan. Leaders of the state's Arab American community also refused to meet with Biden's campaign team last week. And an Economist YouGov poll last month showed that 50 percent of people who voted for Biden in 2020 believe Israel is committing genocide against Palestinian civilians. That's 50 percent of his voters. It's clear Israel's war on Gaza and the American support for it is currently the biggest foreign policy issue of the campaign season. And what's incredible is the man who's almost certainly going to face off against Biden in November has said nothing of substance about it. In fact, as we saw yesterday, he just deflects questions about it outright. If you were in the White House today, would you strike Iran directly? It wouldn't have happened if I were in the White House. You would have never had this attack. You would have never had the attack on Israel. You would have never had the attack on Ukraine. Uh, you would not have inflation that was, you know, just is destroying our country. Nothing. It never would have happened. Therefore, I have no position. Therefore, you can just project whatever you want onto me. See how that works? There was a time in American politics not that long ago when a leading candidate, if something happened in foreign relations like this, they would host like a press call with their campaign's policy experts. They would put out a policy paper and a statement. They might even make a speech. 
Because a big part of campaigning for public service and the presidency used to be having a position on major policy questions. Not for Donald Trump. There is literally no position, zero position whatsoever from him on the Gaza war. But here's the thing, we don't have to guess what Donald Trump's policy as president would be because, again, he was actually in the White House. He has an actual record in the Middle East. A reminder of what that is, next. Iran will insist on an even better deal than they made with Obama. I terminated that deal. I terminated that deal. And we moved the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. That's for the evangelicals. And Golan Heights, don't forget Golan Heights. We did Golan Heights. So we've done a lot. That's for the evangelicals. While Donald Trump avoids taking a policy position on what is happening in the Middle East now, he was not shy about his position on the Middle East when he was actually in the White House. For those four years, Trump was squarely aligned with the priorities of the most right-wing forces in Israeli politics. He moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem as they wanted. He ripped up the Iran deal as they wanted, which was the highest priority for the right-wing government of Israel. He recognized the contested Golan Heights as part of Israel. Those are all priorities of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who called him his, quote, dear friend, Donald. Tommy Vitor served as spokesperson for President Obama in the U.S. National Security Council. He is now the co-host of Pod Save the World, co-author of the upcoming book, Democracy or Else, How to Save America in 10 Easy Steps. He joins me now. Tommy, I wanted to talk to you because I've been listening to your podcast about this stuff, and I think you and I have similar views uh, about about the current trajectory of American foreign policy there under mm-hmm. Biden, um, that 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 you know it, it's it can't go on like this, that it's it's causing real damage both politically, strategically, and and morally in the humanitarian sense. But it is crazy to me that in the midst of a campaign, there's just no question about what the policy of the other guy is or would be. You're right. I mean, it's stunning, Chris. It's funny listening to you talk about how uh, back in the day, there would be a conference call with foreign policy advisors and op-eds. And it's just like, oh, yeah, an entirely different era of politics when we were coming up and running against people like John McCain or Mitt Romney. But you're right. I mean, Trump does have this record on Israel, recognizing the Golan Heights. He cut funding to the Palestinians, to UNRWA, uh, which was another thing the Israelis wanted. He brokered the Abraham Accord deals where the U.S. gave uh, huge concessions to autocrats in the region in exchange for normalizing relations with Israel. In the case of the UAE's deal with the Israelis, it was basically a huge arms sales agreement between the U.S. and the UAE. And unfortunately, um, those Abraham Accord deals made the Palestinians feel completely forgotten about and left behind uh, because leaders who once championed their cause were now normalizing relations with Israel. And they felt forgotten. The Palestinians did. And they felt forgotten in large part because Netanyahu told them they had been forgotten. So Trump certainly poured gas on the fire that got us to today. Yes, there was a lot of, of stuffing, to mix metaphors, stuffing powder into that powder keg over, over that, that period of time. I want to just, this is sort of a nerdy point, but I'm going to just go with it here. I, I, just so that people don't think I'm crazy. Like, you worked on the 08 campaign in 012. Like, it really was a thing. You're running for office. Something happens in the world. And yeah. you, you've got this, like, little committee that will be, like, people who are real experts on the, on the politics of the thing. And they'll be like, all this work will get done. What is our position? What do we think on this? There'll be memos that, right? I'm not crazy about this. Like, this was a real thing that used to happen in American political campaigns for president. All the time. Uh, 2008, when Russia invaded Georgia, it upended the campaign. The entire weekend, the next couple of weeks, was taken over by conversations about foreign policy, getting experts on the phone, talking to reporters about our positions. It was an important substantive debate about how McCain and Obama viewed the world and respond to these things. And you're right. In this case, Trump just won't say anything about it, except never would have happened if I was president. I think he also once said the Civil War never would have happened if he had been president. So, you know, maybe we take that right. with a grain of salt. <laughs> right. I mean, it is wild to think of, like, how much the, the, the sort of political class and press would, have, press would have freaked out if Barack Obama in 2008 said, well, I don't know what to tell you, it never would have happened. They, they never would have right. invaded Georgia if, if, if I've already was president. Like, that doesn't, that doesn't fly. And I think it's, 
it's it's smart politically precisely for the political reasons that I identified. I mean, that polling number to me was pretty shocking that 50 percent, 50 percent of Biden voters believe that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza it just purely as a political issue with your own voters. That is a pretty intense red flag. And Trump and the Republicans are smart enough to recognize why say anything when this is such a brutal issue for the Democratic coalition? Yes, Trump is smart when it comes to politics. He knows that the hard right pro-Israel evangelicals will never vote for Biden. They will right. always be with him. Right. He knows that the progressive left is upset with at Biden. And he also knows that there's the Tucker Carlson right that is more, you know, America right. first. Why would we intervene overseas? They they hate this war. They think Lindsey Graham is crazy. So right. he's just going to sit silently and he's a war act test. You see what you want to see. And this gets back to this sort of the sort of ways the norms and rules of running for president have so sort of deteriorated because one of the things that used to happen was everyone wanted to do that. Like the whole point is, right, you never want to take a position on anything when you're running for office uh, that's contentious because it's easier not to, right? But the whole point of the, of the mechanics of what a campaign used to be, which Trump has sort of unilaterally destroyed, was to force politicians to do exactly that. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have a platform in 2020, right? I mean, so yes, he's he is running as a blank slate and folks see celebrity and they see bravado and they see, I guess, you know, four years in office and they there's some under the, uh, some economic sentiment that is carried over that they feel like they benefited from in the Trump years. But yeah, he's running on nothing now. David Friedman, who was the Trump ambassador to Israel, which again, personnel uh, is, is politics. He basically said, look, this is a, he criticized Biden saying, he says, at no time did the United States put any handcuffs or limitation on Israel's ability to respond. You know very well, particularly in foreign policy, personnel is policy, and we know who the personnel would be under a Trump administration. I don't think it's at all nutty. Yeah, listen, I, I think that if you don't like what Joe Biden uh, is doing with respect to Gaza right now, you would hate what Donald Trump would be doing. There is absolutely no consideration for human rights. Um, I think he would give Bibi Netanyahu carte blanche to conduct any military campaign he wanted. There would be no pressure on him to worry about civilian casualties, and it would be it would be terrible. But there's just one bipartisan point I want to make, Chris, which is that you know you hear all this talk about the need to restore deterrence against Iran, and that's always code for revenge or bombing yeah. them or some sort of military campaign. No one is out there making the case for diplomacy. Yeah. The, the periods of time when we saw these attacks on U.S. forces in places like Iraq and it's in Syria either stop or slow down was when the U.S. and Iran were engaged in talks, yeah. either directly or through uh, Oman or some other country. That is how we keep our, our personnel safe abroad. It's not by escalating these wars. It's by talking to our enemies. I, That's what diplomacy is. Totally agree. Tommy Vitor, thank you very much. That does it for All In. You can catch us every weeknight at 8 o'clock on MSNBC. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash All In With Chris.